gonna start this thing off right. We got Valentine titties in the house tonight. What's up, P Hope family? It's your girl P Hope, and I am back with another Love After Lockup, Life After Lockup review. This is season three, episode 30, I believe. First, I want to start this video off by saying happy Valentine's Day to everybody. I know the episode came out Friday, but y'all know I'm always behind. So I just thank y'all so much for still tuning in whenever I drop these videos. I love you, love you, love you so much. And what better day to say I love you than Valentine's Day. You see, I'm giving y'all a little Zora the Explorer with no bang bang. You know what I'm saying? I'm putting a little eyelashes on, a little makeup. I did a little something for y'all today just to show my love now me and my baby are definitely going to be celebrating valentine's day today but we are going quarantine style i am going to transform um my bedroom into a nice little romantic picnic area and we're going to have candles and wine and italian food and movies and we are just going to love and cuddle on each other and call that a day like i don't want to be out it's real wet cold and rainy here so um yeah i don't want to be out in the elements so you know we just figured out something cute and simple to do for this valentine's day and um, we're just gonna exchange gifts and that's gonna be it so i hope that you guys are doing everything that you wanted to do today with your loved ones whether it be your pets your children your friends your family whoever it is that you want to be your valentines or palentines or whatever the case may be i hope you have a wonderful wonderful day now that all of that is out the way, let's get right into the ratchet. I want to start with John and Cristiano. Okay, so we have a scene where John is outside shining up the damn Thunderbird. It's a Thunderbird, a Firebird, one of them damn birds. And um, he's cleaning it up because Cristiano is coming home in 24 hours. And so while he's outside scrub-a-dub-dub in the car, Tara is in the house packing her shit and getting ready to go. So um, she ends up coming outside and she's like, you know, yeah, what's up? Because John says ever since he broke the news that she had to leave, they literally have not said a word to each other. So, um, you can imagine how awkward the house must be, but I mean, it is what it is because I'm definitely with John on this. If I got to choose between my sister-in-law and my wife, like it's a no brainer. I'm going with the wife, like mama, you can feel however you want to feel. But at the end of the day, I married Christiana so that we could be together. So, you know, I don't know what y'all want me to do about this whole terror situation. So anyway, Tara's outside and she's like, so John um, was asking her like, so, you know, where are you about to go? And she said, well, you know, I'm probably just going to try to go crash a couple of nights over at my ex-boyfriend house. And, you know, you know how that's go. So, you know, without saying so much, she was pretty much saying nine times out of ten, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to throw my legs up, we're going to get high, and I'm going to be back to doing the same old shit that I was doing before you came and rescued me. Oh. That's pretty much what she was saying in so little words. And so John was like, okay, all right, well, you know, um, I think he asked her how she was getting there. She was like, you know, my ride is on the way or whatever, but she was, she was being real dry with him and was pretty much saying like, bro, don't worry about it. Like, you done put me out, so let me just figure out what the hell I'm doing from this point. And she, you could tell that she's very upset and she's very bitter. Which, I'm not saying that she does not have a right to be upset because that is a very, like, spur of the moment thing. Like, you know, she didn't have time to strategize where she was going to go, what she was going to do. So, I mean, it is a very jacked up situation. So, I do understand her frustration. But she also has a lot of vindictiveness in that as well. 
So she lets us know in the confessional that, well, first she was still talking to John and she was like, well, you know, when my sister gets home, I'm going to come see her. Like, I'm sure she wants to see me because I help her and she helps me. And John was like, well, you know, that's cute and all, but um, at the end of the day, rules are rules. And I don't know if these people are going to be casing out my house. You don't know when her probation officer is going to pull up at any given time. And at the end of the day, if I can avoid anything that's going to prevent her from getting in trouble, like I'm going to prevent it. And you are one of those situations. So if you come over to my house, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And she was like, are you serious? And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm dead ass serious. Like you can't come to my house. So this put her in super bitch mode. And so she let us know in the confessional that, you know, I definitely be coming to see my sister. And regardless of whether I can come to this house or not, I'm going to make sure my sister knows exactly what's going on or what could have possibly went on between me and John because she needs to know. Now, like I keep telling y'all with that whole situation, like, I don't understand how Tara thinks that she's finna break this whole scenario down to Christiana without Christiana wanting to beat her ass. You see what I'm saying? Like, I just want to know how you gonna put 20 on 10 to make it look like it's all on John. Even though, I mean, in all honesty, it could be pretty easy to put it all on John because of his fucked up history with cheating. I don't know if Christiana already knows about that or not, but I'm sure that by this point, she has watched the episodes just like we have. So, you know, I would love, love, love to hear from Christiana and just really see what she really feels about this whole John and Tara situation because it's a mess.com. It is messy boots. But that's pretty much all we got from um, John, Tara, and Christiana. And so I guess in the further episodes, we'll figure out, you know, what the hell's going to happen when Christiana finally bring her ass home. So that was them, y'all. Let's go to Brittany and Marcelino. So y'all remember where we left off last week with um, Brittany Miss Cindy and Grandmama Jackie up there in Alaska. So they pick up from that scene right there. So at this point, we already remember that Miss Cindy had got up, took her ass outside, and she said that she was completely over this situation because Miss Jackie does not want to take responsibility for anything that happened to Miss Cindy as a child. You know, she told her all that shit about, you know, I didn't make you run away. I didn't put no crack pipe in your mouth. You know, pretty much everything that you did was because you wanted to do it. And Miss Jackie is not trying to take responsibility for any of her actions actions and it is really just messing with Miss Cindy which it, it would mess with any of us like if you know your truth and something that happened to you and then the person that's responsible or partially responsible for it won't even take accountability for their part in it like that's got to be frustrating as hell like it's just got to be so I'm completely on Miss Cindy's side in this um, particular situation because you can tell that she ain't lying on Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie is an evil bitch and it's going to be one of those situations where Miss Cindy is just going to have to let it go. Don't expect an apology. Don't expect her to take responsibility for any of her actions and just let karma do what the fuck karma does. Like period. And you best believe like the saying says, if you don't bow on the front end, you gonna bow on the back end. Cause either way it go, you gonna bow. So, and that's going, that's what's gonna happen to Miss Jackie's ass. Either way it go, that bitch gonna bow. So, you know, whether Miss Cindy, whether you actually get to witness the payback that that comes, which I'm sure, I'm sure Miss Jackie you know, um, reaps has been reaping a little bit of what she's sown, you know, throughout the years or whatever. Like, we don't know what goes on in Miss Jackie's day to day life, but you know, at this point, that's one of them situations where you just have to let go and let God, and that is what 
um, Brittany was pretty much outside just telling her, like, okay, we see that this did not go the way that I expected it to go. You expected it to go. So at this point, we just gonna go because, you know what I'm saying, Miss Jackie is not going to take responsibility for anything. So, you know, let's just pack this shit up and call it a day. So then it shoots to a scene of the next day. So they wake up the next morning and Brittany and Marcelino and all the kids are already dressed. They're down there in their little fatigue uniforms and stuff. And they look really cute. You know what I'm saying? Um, the girls are dressed in their girly attire, but it's still fatigue. And then, of course, the men look like little soldiers. So it's cute. And then um, Miss Cindy comes downstairs. She does not have on fatigue like the rest of the family, but she does have on a little green top and some blue jeans. And, you know, she's just kind of tipping down into the situation. And she's like, oh, you know, you guys look cute this morning. And so Brittany is like, yeah. And she was like, I, you know, I, I see you too. Miss Cindy came down the steps looking like me, y'all. She had a beat. Wow. And so Brittany was like, where, you got on so much makeup. And she was like, oh, it, is it too much? Do I have on too much makeup? And Brittany was like, hey, look. Do what you do. If if that's how much makeup you wanted to wear this morning, then do you. Look, Miss Cindy, you got on too much makeup. I probably got on too much makeup. But hell, if that's... Listen, if that's what we need to make us feel popping on the day that we need it, then we just going to continue to do us. You know what I'm talking about? So, because I know I don't know how to put on no damn makeup, but I'm just making it do what it do on this good V-Day. <laughs> So anyway, moving past all that, we finally figured out why the hell Miss Cindy got all this makeup on. And that's because her baby Zeddy, a.k.a. ex-husband, a.k.a. Britney's stepdaddy, is coming to visit. So I was like, oh, okay. I see what you're doing, Miss Cindy. So what she was doing is putting on her Sunday best. So that when he pull up, he can want that old thing back. He can want that old flame back. You know what I'm saying? So, that's what ends up happening is that the dad does show up. But the catch 22 to that, the kicker was, he pulled up with his current, I want to say that that's his current wife. But it could just be the girlfriend. But either way... She wasn't checking for Miss Cindy, and Miss Cindy really wasn't checking for her. You know what I'm saying? The the um the stepdaddy greeted her. <laughs> the stepdaddy greeted Miss Cindy, and of course he greeted the rest of the household. And then when it was time for the new girlfriend and Miss Cindy to introduce each other, um, child, that little handshake was so damn weak. She was like. Mm -hmm. But we did notice that the girlfriend had like a broke finger or something like this. Like something was, she had her finger bandaged up. So maybe that's why it looked so shady. But th the ladies really weren't checking for each other. But anyway, moving past that. So, you know, everybody's talking and hey, how you doing it and all this and that. And then... The stepdaddy goes to talk to Miss Cindy and he's like, you know, hey, how you doing? And she was like, I'm good. I'm good. And then she said, well, you looking good. And he said, mm-hmm. And then I guess he felt down in his spirit that he was being kind of rude. So then he hit her with the, yeah, you, uh -huh, you do too. You, you, uh -huh, you look nice too. And so then he was like, Brittany, let me, um, let me holler at you for a second. And they end up going outside to have a conversation. And back then, before he could shut the goddamn door good, he said, what the hell is your mama doing here? Uh, what is she doing here? And when I say I fell back on my bed because he was me. Somebody, first of all, don't do that. Don't motherfucking do that. Let me know what I'm walking into. I did not know I was walking in to seeing my ex-wife. Like, you should have let me know that and I could have got my spirit together to be ready to deal with that. And so then he went into a conversation asking Brittany what she's still using. 
And Brittany pretty much said yes, you know, she haven't used in the last couple of days or whatnot, but yeah, she's still out here doing what she do. And he was like, yeah, I can tell. I can tell from how she looked that that was the case. So what I'm trying to tell you is you don't need to let your mom's issues be your issues. Like, don't do that. The stepdad said that if he cannot leave Brittany with any other information, he wanted to let her know that your mom's problems are not your problems. You are clean and sober, happy, beautiful. You have your own family. You're moving forward in life. And I would hate for your mother to drag you in a backwards spiral. It is very easy for somebody that has an addiction to, um, what am I trying to say? To convince somebody that has already had an addiction to kind of, you know, go back into old habits. And, you know, the stepdad was pretty much just like, you know, it will break my heart if I ever seen or heard any of that kind of news. So the best advice that I can give for you is to cut your mom off the same way that I cut your mom off. So, you know, that was, he was spilling his own tea and he let us, he let us know that, you know, he at one point, he had an addiction. I don't remember if he suffered from drugs, alcohol or both, but he did let us know that, you know, he had his own demons that he was battling at one point. And he got ready to change that about himself. So he had to let certain people go. And he was just saying that, you know, Cindy was one of those people that he had to let go of. And she continued to do what she was doing. And he is growing and flourishing in life. So he just doesn't want to see Britney go down the wrong road. So that was pretty much all that they had going on with that. Because after that, the stepdaddy and uh, the girlfriend, wife, whoever she is, she was ready to go. Like, everybody was ready to go. Then it cuts to a scene. <laughs> they did a small little fishing scene where it shows them going fishing. And um, baby, uh, what is his name? Oh, I forget the little, the little boy name, the oldest little boy. But anyway, um, you know, they went on a little fishing trip or whatever. The little boy ended up catching a fish. Marcelino... You know how crazy he is. He felt a little certain kind of way because the baby caught the fish and he didn't catch no fish. But they still had a good time. That was a cute little scene. And that was pretty much how it closed out for um, Brittany and Marcelino. And I guess we will pick up with them again next week because um, I told y'all that I thought she said before they went on that trip that the purpose of going was to see... Britney's mom, Britney's husband, ex-husband, and Britney's dad. So I'm thinking that we're still going to get another Alaska scene from them because we have not met Miss Cindy's dad yet, okay? So that was it for Britney and Marcelino this week. Let's move on. Shane and Lacey. Okay, y'all. Shane and Lacey. Uh, they started their scene with, uh, Lacey and her dad sitting in a restaurant. And, you know, this is not one of those happy-go-lucky daughter-father moments because Lacey is there to get some straightening. Lacey wants to know, why the hell did you feel like it was your right and your business to tell Shane that John was out and that I knew all about it? And so the daddy was pretty much like, well, you know, first of all, I felt like he needed to know. And second of all, if you didn't have some kind of sneaky motive and you call yourself so-called done with John, then why the hell does it matter anyway? Huh? Huh? And so Lacey was sitting there pissed. And I couldn't really, y'all, I can't even really tell y'all what all Lacey was saying to her dad because I was stuck on the fact of why her lips are getting way bigger than her face. I know y'all saw that shit. I know y'all saw that shit. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand pregnancy. I have gone through two pregnancies. I have 
two children. So I understand that the facial structure for most women during pregnancy does change. My nose went all the way across my damn face. So I am the last one to be talking. But y'all remember, Lacey had these lip injections before she got pregnant. So I just want to know, is she continuing to get these lips pumped up? Or is this the baby doing this to her? Because at this point, them bitches look like they about to blow. They about to blow at any given moment. And it's scary looking. I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Whew. But I do remember Lacey telling her dad, like, you know, you already know the relationship that me and you have. And that, you know, that relationship is something that we have not always had. But, you know, now that you're here and you're in my life, we are very close. So things that I tell you, I tell you this stuff in confidence. You know what I'm saying? And so that's when... I forgot if the dad told a story or if Lacey told a story. But either way, they go into talking about the past. Lacey said that um, her mom was uh, an alcoholic. And I don't remember if she dealt with substance abuse. But I know she definitely said alcohol. So um, a lot of times, you know, her mom would be there. But she was not there. You know, she was pretty much out of it a lot. And then um, at some point, the dad was just not in her life for a long span of time. I was half listening, y'all. I'm just be honest with y'all. Uh, that little scene, I had kind of blanked out a little bit. So I don't remember if the dad said that he did some jail time or if he just, you know, him and the mama was going through some stuff. So he just left and did his own thing. But... Whatever it was, that period of time that Lacey's dad was not in her life, she said that, you know, that was a real fucked up time period for her. So, um, at a very, very young age, she got involved with alcohol and drug use. You know, Lacey said that she'd been there, been there, done that at a very, very young age. And I was happy that she shared that with us because it made a little more sense of why she is so addicted to John. You know, this is the same this is the same issues that John have. John cannot stay away from the drugs. John cannot stay away from the alcohol. So um it would make sense that Lacey would find herself falling in love with somebody that has those type of issues. And um so she shared that with us and I thought that that was, you know, that was an important piece of the puzzle that we needed from Lacey. And um I don't remember if the dad actually ended up apologizing for um, spreading Lacey's business to Shane, but he did do a little damage control because the next thing that they showed is the dad rolling up to John's house. You know, he's rolling up. He put his car in park. He like, you know what I'm saying? I'm sick of this mother lover. You know what I'm saying? I'm about to end this right here and right now. So, he knocks on the door. He's like, yeah, you know, it's John home. John comes to the, uh, John comes to the door. He's like, yeah, you know, I, I just needed to talk to you. Can we talk? So, he was like, yeah, let me step outside. So, John's standing up on the porch and dad is at the bottom of the steps. And he's like, look, I knew you was out because my daughter told me you was out. But, you know, all of these harassing texts and phone calls and constantly, constantly calling her, that's going to have to stop. My daughter has moved on. She's happy. She's with Shane. And you need to take your punk ass on somewhere and leave her alone. And so, at this point, John done got to looking crazy because he gave me the vibes that he hadn't been contacting Lacey no more. Like, bro, I ain't even been calling your daughter or texting your daughter. So, what is you talking about? But he never said that part. The rebuttal was, look, old man, <laughs> you better get on up out of here before I knock your ass out. And I said, uh-oh, daddy. He said, he'll knock your bitch ass out. And daddy said, oh, yeah? Well, bring it on. Bring it on. And I said, daddy, now, daddy, I understand 
that you in your feelings right now and I understand that you feel like you can take over the world. But daddy, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at John and I'm looking at you and I'm looking at John. And daddy, as much as I fuck with you, John gonna knock your bitch ass out. And that's just dead on that. I mean, daddy, you ain't got a chance in hell. You ain't need, you barely, you. <laughs> daddy, go get in your car. Go get in your car. So, you know, after they get done exchanging words, if you will, he said, well, I just came over here to tell you to leave my daughter alone. And that's all I wanted to say. And John was like, okay, cool. I can leave your daughter alone. But you let me know this one thing. Did she call the cops on me? He gave John a motherfucking up, down, up, down. And he said, of course she called the cops on your dumb ass. This lady got three kids that she needs to take care of and that she have to look out for. She don't have time for you and this dumb ass shenanigans that you like to do whenever you get drunk or high. Of course she called the cops on you. And again, two weeks in a row, we've seen John's face just completely shattered. It just shattered. Like, he was like, wow, like, deep in my heart, I knew it, but I just really needed for somebody to say it. So now we all looking at the daddy like, first of all, <laughs> first of all, don't tell daddy your business because... Daddy just gonna say whatever the fuck he feel like saying when he feel like saying it. Like, I got a feeling that even if you came to daddy and was like, look, this is not to go past your ears. I do not need you to repeat this to anyone. If daddy feel like it need to be repeated, he's gonna repeat it. Like, that's just, he don't give a damn. So, I got a feeling that that's going to get him in trouble as well. But at least John now knows the answers that he has been looking for. Lacey did call the police on him. And I do feel like the homegirl from last week, I feel like she knew that. And she just, you know what I'm saying, played her friend role and was just like, look, I don't know who called the cops on you, but does it really matter? Like, that that's the route that she took. And I feel like that's kind of what daddy should have did. But he don't give a damn. And he doesn't give a fuck about John anyway. So, he was happy to spill the beans. He was, he was quite excited to spill the beans. And that's what happened. John just um, ultimately ends up saying that he cannot believe that he was ever in love with such a manipulative, sneaky snake in the grass kind of person that would ever call the police on him and you know he just has pretty much thrown Lacey in the boat of snitches like at the end of the day snitches get stitches and he don't give a damn about her no more like he he's not starry eyed about her like a bitch be gone okay and that's all we got for Shane and Lacey for this week and we're gonna move right along Amber and Puppy. Okay, I'm going to try to make theirs very short and sweet because it's repetitive and they really ain't talking about too much. So, um, their situation is they are on their way to meet with a lawyer to see exactly what can be done about this whole um, adoption through Vince um, situation. And so they get to the lawyer's office and the long and the short of it is the lawyer pretty much told them that, you know, if anything happens to Vincent, then Puppy would take full custody of anything that Vincent owns. Now, I don't know, you know, if he has this shit ton of money or if he has property or anything worth value. Like, is it really worth um, Puppy waiting until this man falls off the face of the earth? I don't know. But um, she says that that's an option. And the lawyer, I mean, it, to me, it sounded like the lawyer was pretty much saying that that's pretty much the best way to go. But... Puppy also wanted to know how much is it going to cost her if she just wants to say the hell with it and, you know, and reverse this thing because, like, 
in order for, for the adoption to have taken place at all, some paperwork would have had to be signed on both persons. And Puppy said, <clears throat> and Puppy said that she never signed any paperwork. Um, you know, so something has been forged somewhere. So she wanted to know if she wanted to go through the court system to, to talk about the forgery part of it. Like how much is that going to cost her? And the lawyer said to even start, um, a case like that, it's going to start at $15,000 to even, you know, attain her. And so, you know, they looking like, well, goddamn, like, I didn't expect you to, to pull that kind of number out your ass, but all right. And so, the, after they leave the lawyer's office, they go grab a bite to eat, and Puppy wants to call Vincent to pretty much just put him up on game and let them know, let him know that, um, you know, that they're taking about, they're thinking about taking this through the legal system. And that what he's doing is not right. And Vincent really doesn't give a damn. He doesn't give a damn. And he said that, look, you're calling me. I can tell that you definitely got a little pressure in your chest. And at the end of the day, if you want to do something about it, then do something about it. But what I'm telling you is don't call my damn phone no more. That's what I'm telling you. And so after they hang up, Puppy is still stuck on wanting to talk to Vincent, see Vincent, and pretty much just do something vindictive towards him because she just feels like he got over. But like the lawyer was trying to explain to Puppy and Amber is that a lot of times people out in the free world, we feel like inmates is trying to get over on us. But in a lot of situations, people in the free world are trying to get over on the inmates. And that and that the situation that they're in, this is what it looks like. It looks like Vincent is trying to get over on Amber and Puppy. So it's just a case of they're going to have to fight it. They're going to have to fight it. And Puppy says that she'll rather just knock his ass off and get it over with. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, whatever he got it all belongs to her so you know she'll she'll take whatever she can get and um and that whole situation has done just irritated it done irritated amber to the point where she don't want to talk about it see him she's just done with it all together because she heard the part on the phone where vincent was saying like you know you and amber cited me out you know what i'm saying y'all sought me out and y'all pinpointed me to be y'all's, you know, dummy or, or, or y'all's trick or whatever it is that y'all wanted. And you just mad because that shit backfired. That's how Vincent feels about it. So now he just wants them girls to leave him alone. And so it's pissing Amber off because she's like, you know, that was never the case. Like, I always consider him my boyfriend. And yeah, when I got out... I just wasn't feeling him like that. And the situation, you know what I'm saying? It just didn't work out. But were we trying to get over on him? No, that was never the case. So, you know, at this point, I don't want to see this man, hear from this man. I don't know why Puppy is so hell-bent on keep trying to mess with him and irritate him and aggravate him. But I just want to be done with it. I just want it to be over. <laughs> Sean and Destiny. Whoo, Lord. Y'all know they make my ass itch. Sean and Destiny, we are still at the courthouse scene. Okay. They are outside of the courthouse. And Sean is standing there. Now that Destiny done got her ass back out the car. And they're over in a little grassy area. And Sean is just pretty much letting her know that, look, I'm not leaving this damn courthouse yard until you give me some answers. Destiny says she doesn't have to explain a bitch ass thing to him because of all of the lies and shit that he has told in the past. She doesn't owe him an explanation for shit. 
And then to add insult on top of injury, she takes her ring off and she chucks it at his ass. And she said, yeah, now take your fucking ring. And if that doesn't let you know that we're over, then I don't know what the hell will let you know that we're over. And then when she does her little confessional, she let us know that she is definitely dating someone else. So that would be, you know, a couple of episodes back when her sister asked her who was that on the phone and who was she talking to. And she was like, you know, don't pretty much don't worry about it. Get out my business. That was the other dude that she's talking to. So, you know, she said she's in a new relationship. She's moved on. And y'all remember last week she told us Sean wasn't nothing but a trick. So, hey, it is what it is. So, she done got in the car that belongs to Sean. Sean pays the note on and she has this man's credit cards. She jumps in the car and she rides off into the wind. So, at this point, Sean is forced to just, you know, get in his car and take off as well. Now, on the ride back to wherever the hell Sean is going, that's when the light bulb came on. Why the light bulb is just now coming on, I don't know. Do you know? Because, I mean, you got to be slow boots. If the light just came on, that this girl was playing you and using you. Like, we've all known this from day one. Hector told you, don't do it. But what did you do? You still did it. And the thing about the thing is, he admitted that he is still in love with Destiny. And he still wants to work this thing out. But, so the light bulb comes on for his ass. And he realizes, this is really it. Like, it's over. She won. She's got me on hold for these $50,000. She's driving around in a car that I paid for. She's maxed all my credit cards out. Like, she won. She did everything that she sought out to do. So now, now it's time for me to get my head in the game and get a little bit of revenge. So he still has the address that he got from the pizza dude. So he used that address to see, to kind of case out the place and see what she gonna be there. When he pulled up, she was not there. But he ended up parking on a street that was adjacent to where destiny is living at and he said well you know i'm just gonna chill out here for a little while and see if my car pops up because what he plans to do is to call the tow truck driver and have his vehicle towed to the nearest dealership that's what he wants to do and i think that's a wonderful idea because bitch if you don't want me then it's gonna go one of two ways Pay me for this car that you're riding around here in that's in my name and that I'm paying the note on and run me my credit cards. Or, 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 I'm coming to repo my shit straight up and down. Straight up and down. Like, what do you think? What, I mean, Destiny, what did you think was going to happen? Like did, like, did you just forget for a second that this car didn't belong to you and that all of these, you know, shopping sprees and food purchases and all of this other stuff that you done had going on, you forgot that all of that stuff was sponsored through Sean? You had to have because the way that you sat there and talked to that man like he was less than nothing was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. It was very unwarranted because... You did not have any valid points to talk to him the way that you talked to him. Because him lying about his age was something he did back on episode one. Him lying about how many kids he had was back at episode one. You having an issue with Kelly was back at episode two or three. So every point that you're bringing up is old as fuck. So you had a choice while you were still in Vegas. You could have got over that shit then, but you chose to sit there and keep dealing with that because you thought that you were just going to keep running and running and running and running this man money in the ground. And if all these court dates wouldn't keep popping up, you probably would still be in Vegas, um, you know, running his shit in the ground. You probably would, and I'll give you that. But at the end of the day, you still lose because... 
first of all, you got to go back to jail. I don't remember um, in the updates. if she, I think somebody did tell me she's already back locked up. But anyway, you still got to go back to jail. He didn't end up being the person that you thought he was going to be. And I really, really hope, Sean, for your sake, I hope that you have smartened up enough that even though now that Destiny is back locked up, do not let her call you with this sweet talking shit. Don't let her call you talking about, oh, you know, I was just frustrated and, you know, I just felt like I was under so much pressure because I was going back to jail. You know, I love you. You know, I need you. You know, you're the only one to take care of me. You know, it wasn't no other man. It's all bullshit. You need to go all the way back to episode whatever that was when Hector held up all the signs for your ass and told you, steer clear of this bitch. Okay? Run. So, the last little part for um, Sean and Destiny is the fact that <laughs> we're waiting on the tow truck to pull up. The tow truck driver said it's going to take him an hour to get there. So, um, at this point, we just going to uh, wait till whenever he pull his ass up. And so, we'll catch them at some point either next week or the week after. Because y'all know they rotate couples, um, you know, who they're going to put in the scene and who they're not for just depending on what week it is. So... Within the next week or two, we'll see what happens when this damn tow truck driver pull up. That was that. Last but not least, y'all, we got Sarah and Michael. Their little scene was um, real short and sweet. Y'all remember last week was when Malcolm dumped the fuck out of Sarah's ass because he said, I don't know if you thought I was boo-boo the fool or fool the boo-boo, but I'm going to let you know I'm not either one. So, what you can do is go back home to your baby daddy and y'all can have a great day. And that's exactly what the fuck Sarah did. Even though she got left at that restaurant holding the bill, that was pie on her face. Jesus Christ, that was pie on her face. But she deserved it. She definitely deserved it. So, anyway, she gets back home and she already let us know on the drive back home that she was not going to tell Michael how that day ended up going because she is not giving him the satisfaction of knowing that he had that much control over her relationships. So when she got in the house, of course, that was one of his first questions. He was like, so, you know, how'd your little fairy tale date go? And she was like, it was fine. And he was like, what did y'all do? And she was like, you know, we went to a restaurant. Well, what restaurant? Mike, come on now. You know, we went to eat. And then he was like, did y'all smash? And she was like, yep, show sure did. And it was good too. And he was like, mm -hmm. let me check. So then he was trying to move her little pillow that was sitting on top of her whatever. And she was like, go, Mike, go somewhere. And... I'm just like, Lord, she was loving every little minute of all the little flirting that he was doing. But anyway, so he finally left her alone about that or whatever. And um, then they go into this conversation and he was like, so y'all smashed? And she was like, yep, yeah, we sure did. And he was like, oh man, you done cheated on me. You know, I'm heartbroken. I am truly heartbroken. And so Sarah was like, boy, please, like, you is not heartbroken. All the mess you be out here doing on me. And then they do a little short confessional with Michael. And he lets us know that, you know, him and Sarah are in an open marriage. You know, she does her, he does him. And when they want to do each other, then, you know, that's all up to him. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't initiate the sex, but she does give the sex up whenever He's ready for it, you know, was pretty much how he broke that down for us. So, you know, they're just sitting on the couch or whatever. And Sarah was like, <laughs> you know, bloop, got your nose. And he was like, oh, you know, well, shoot, I got your nose too. They just started playing and flirting with each other out of nowhere. And then Sarah acts like, you know, she just also tired at this point. So now she want to go in her room. And switch up the tempo, you know what I'm saying? She want to change clothes and do all this and that. And the third, I'm sorry, y'all. I keep um looking out my, I keep looking out my window because I know my neighbors or when anybody is outside, I know they probably be looking up here like, you know what the hell is going on up there? But anyway, 
Um, what was I talking about? Oh, Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. So yeah, so Sarah making like um making like she also oh damn tired. And then she go in her room, and here all you see is Mike talking about some. He was looking to see what she was going, where she was going, and what she was about to do. And when he realized that she was going back there in her room and she was done for the night, baby, he slithered his ass on in just like a damn snake. As soon as the door shut, all you could hear her doing was. <laughs> What the hell? I said, oh, Lord. So, it ain't no telling what the hell they're going to be talking about next week. Did they smash? Did they not smash? Did she put him out? Did she let him sleep beside her on the floor with the kids? Look, we already know how this cycle goes. So, if he got what he was trying to get, then I will not be surprised. But Mike, I will tell you this. Sarah said that she smashed Malcolm on the date. So for you to be that thirsty that you would want to go right behind Malcolm and smash her as well on the same night, that says something about you, my guy. That says one of two things. That says that you really are jealous, that she's out here moving on to bigger and better things, and that she is trying to leave your ass in the wind, and you feel some type of way about that. So you're trying to, you know, hone those reins back in with the pain. You're hoping that the pain is going to be enough to reel Sarah back in, which I think it could possibly work but anyway it still looks fucked up on you and then number two especially if she was willing to let you smash and she hadn't even showered yet like that makes you double gross my guy so you know just think about it let that sizzle in your spirit and we will catch up with you guys next week because that was it for this episode of Love After Lockup. Again, I hope that you all have a wonderful, wonderful Sunday, Valentine's Day. I love you all so much. And I will catch you in the next video, which is The Bell Collective. And yeah, this is your girl, P-Hope, hoping that you all will be happy, be healthy, be safe. And I will catch you in 